Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're having a beautiful and inspiring day and thank you so much for joining me today for another art video. In today's video, I'm gonna be sharing my watercolor painting process for a stack of three donuts. As a reference for this painting, I use a photo that I took in my own home studio quite a while ago. And what made things super exciting for me with this painting was that I was gonna be trying Hanemule watercolor paper for the very first time. This is their Burgund 120 pound cold press watercolor paper. And it's actually more of a watercolor paper block. I had to remove the sheet using an X-Acto knife as it has adhesive around all four sides. So this paper is quite a bit different from what I am used to. Also, usually I like using 140 pound watercolor paper, so this is thinner. And I was definitely interested in seeing mainly two things that I often use in my own watercolor painting process. I was interested in seeing how well this paper received different layers of paint. And I also wanted to see how well this paper reacted to techniques that could be a little bit more abrasive that I enjoy using in my own watercolor painting process, such as gentle scrubbing and a little bit of lifting. And all in all, I have to say that the painting process moved along quite smoothly and I was pretty happy with the outcome. I did make sure though that I allowed my watercolor painting to dry completely in between each layer of paint. And I also made sure that I really stayed mindful not to overwork my paper. So I don't wanna say very much about it right now because I am of the belief that one has to try something at least a few times before um, giving any sort of conclusion as to your thoughts about that particular thing. I definitely wanna try this paper out on more completed paintings such as landscapes or still lives, uh, things like that, and then I'll definitely be providing a sort of review. Okay, so before talking a little bit about my watercolor painting process that I followed for this piece, I wanna send out a huge warm welcome to all of you new people just visiting my channel today for the very first time. I am so, so happy that you found me and do consider subscribing because every single week I share new videos with art tips, drawing and painting tutorials, and encouragement for aspiring artists. And if you do subscribe, don't forget to click on that little notification bell so that YouTube can let you know whenever I publish a new video, otherwise you may or may not find out about it. Having said all that, let's jump into a general explanation of the process that I followed to complete this watercolor piece. So the first thing that I did right here is I am preparing the specific colors that I'm gonna be using for my painting. I am actually swatching them out and testing out color mixtures and making sure that those are the colors that I need and if you have been following my videos for a while, you probably already know that I love keeping my color schemes or my uh, amount of colors that I am using for my watercolor paintings limited. For this one, I ended up choosing six different colors. These were all colors from my Winsor & Newton Cotman Line Half Pan Set. And specifically, I am using Cadmium Yellow Pale, Yellow Ochre, Alizarin Crimson, Cerulean Blue, Burnt Umber, and Payne's Gray. Once I had my initial color mixtures already prepared with a little bit of water on my color mixing palette, I used my size 14 round brush from Royal and Langnickel Zen Line watercolor set to pre-wet the area of icing on that top donut with clean water. The only areas that I avoided pre-wetting with water were the areas of highlight that I was able to perceive in my reference picture. And the reason why I didn't pre-wet these areas is because I didn't want any pigment to go into these areas, right? Because watercolors basically bleed into and dissipate into damp paper. This painting was created with a combination of both wet on wet and wet on dry techniques. I mostly used wet on wet for the initial layers of paint, like what you're seeing me do right now. And later on, as I mentioned before, I allowed my painting to dry completely. And then I continued developing darker values and more details in a variety of different layers. And those layers that I started developing later on were mostly created wet on dry. So right here you can see how after having placed a very light and translucent version of my alizarin crimson on this top area of my donut, except for the highlights, I am starting to drop in an even more saturated version of this paint color. 
and I am trying to drop in this pigment specifically in the areas of darker mid-tones or darkest values that I'm able to perceive in my reference picture. I am making sure to leave the lighter values shine through completely in the lighter areas. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I know that I have to develop a wide variety of different values and translucencies in order to make these donuts appear realistic, like they have a three-dimensional form. Okay, so at this point, it's about time to allow that layer of paint to dry there. I don't want to be overly finicky, start overworking my paper or anything of the sort. So I'm just gonna leave it be and allow it to dry. So I am doing the same thing right here for the glaze area on top of my chocolate donut right there in the middle. And I am doing the same thing. I am pre-wetting this area with clean water and just doing my best to avoid areas of highlights. Once I have created a nice even sheen all throughout this area and even allowed my paper to soak up my water a tiny bit, I start dropping in my brown pigment in a light translucent form. And always, always help yourself with a scrap piece of watercolor paper right there on the side. I don't know if you can see that little edge right there. I always have a scrap grab piece of watercolor paper with me to test out colors and transparencies before jumping into my watercolor painting. Because as you know, once you start dropping in your pigment on your paper, it soaks it up and it's pretty difficult to get back to the whiteness the paper once had. Okay, so after that very light initial translucent version of my brown had been laid down, I go in with a more saturated version of the same brown. And because this is a very small area, um, I do have a little bit of trouble keeping this more saturated brown only in the darker areas that I'm able to perceive in my reference picture. So you're just gonna see me move that paint around and use a little bit of lifting with my absorbent towel to make sure that even in this initial point, I'm already starting to create a little bit of dimension and a variety of different values in this area. Okay, so lastly, I go in and do the exact same thing with the bottom donut, which this is a vanilla flavored donut with white icing. And I decided to create my gray values using a mixture of Payne's gray and cerulean blue. When we're going for a realistic look, it's important to develop a variety of different values, even in areas that are white, such as the icing on this donut. Otherwise, it's going to look very flat when compared to the other areas of your painting, which do have a large variety of values developed in them. And even when in reality we have an object that is white in color in front of us, we see a variety of values within it that are created by the lights and the shadows and the planes of its structure. So we never want to leave something completely white. It's similar to how when we are drawing or painting the portrait of a person, we cannot leave the sclera, the white part of the eyes, completely flat white. There is always going to be some sort of shadow and some sort of value development that we have to create even in these tiny areas in the eye to make those eyeballs look spherical and to make them look realistic because there's always some shadow falling on them created by the top eyelid, etc. Um, the same thing happens with our teeth. We don't ever want to leave teeth completely flat white because it's gonna look like a cartoon. So that's basically the idea of what I am doing on the icing of that bottom donut right there. There is this very fine line, especially when working with watercolor, when we're painting an object or a subject that is white and we're developing those different values in there so that it can look um, like it has a three-dimensional form. We have to make sure to stay mindful because if we start adding in way too much color, it stops looking white. And when we're painting with watercolor, as you probably already know, we cannot really correct mistakes very easily or at all. Okay, so after having developed those initial layers of paint and values in the glaze or icing section of my bottom donut, what I did was I pre-wetted my visible bread section of the top donut and I started dropping in some of my bright yellow, which in this case, my brightest yellow that I am using is cadmium yellow pale. As always, I work from very light and translucent and make my way towards darker and more saturated colors. So as you can see, this initial yellow that I am placing on the wetness of my paper is very light and translucent. 
And even at this point, even using this very light and translucent version of my Cadmium Yellow Pale, I am still giving thought to protecting the lightest areas that I am able to perceive in my reference picture. And even at this point, really considering the fact that I have to be developing a variety of different values in all areas of my painting in order for it to look realistic. So you can see how I help myself there with my absorbent towel, do some lifting in some areas that I perceive to be very light in my reference picture. And after having created this initial a translucent layer of yellow in all of the visible bread sections on all of my donuts, with my paper still damp, I go in and start adding in a mixture of cadmium yellow pale and yellow ochre, which is a darker yellow. And I am focusing on dropping in this color mixture in the mid-tone areas in these bread sections of my donuts that I'm able to perceive in my reference picture and staying away from the lightest areas. Further developing a wide range of values. Notice how as I am laying down my paint and shifting the way that I move my paintbrush, I am making sure not to cover up an entire area with a solid block of color. As I am laying down those brush strokes, I am always having the texture of the object or the subject that I am painting in mind. And I also make sure to always have in mind this medium's translucency to use it to its full potential. And whenever I am placing another layer of color, I am not covering up the entire section beneath and I'm always leaving little areas of lighter values shining through. As I am creating these brush strokes, I am thinking of creating little abstract irregular shapes as opposed to heavy blocks of color. And I am also doing my best to stay away from stark looking lines and any organized looking pattern. I wanna keep everything very irregular and organic. So I continue working on these initial layers of yellow values throughout the visible areas of bread on the three donuts. Once again, I am making sure not to be too fussy and not to overwork my paper and allowing the paint to do its thing. It's very helpful to jump around between the different elements in your painting. It's something I really like doing. This enables me to just allow the paint to soak into my paper a bit and even start allowing the paper to dry to a certain degree. Remember that even though this is paper that is created for water soluble mediums, wet paper is fragile paper and we need to have in mind that we often need to allow it to dry and regain its strength before going back in. And in this case, I am being particularly careful because I know that this watercolor paper is thinner than the watercolor paper that I often use. All right, so I'm pretty much done with these initial wet on wet layers that I am creating for these donuts. And I allowed my painting to dry completely before starting to go in with the next layers of my painting process, which are going to be mostly wet on dry now. This is going to enable me to have a greater control as I continue working on those smaller details and also to make sure that I am only keeping these darker values that I am starting to develop in the areas where I really need them and that they're not spreading out and covering all of the previous values that I've created. Because what I am trying to do is ultimately create a wide variety of different values not retract from the variety of values that I've already created. From this point on in the painting process, I'm gonna be using a technique over and over and over again. And what I'm doing is I am basically placing this darker, more saturated color mixture in the darkest areas that I'm able to perceive in my reference picture. And then I go in with a clean and only slightly dampened paintbrush and gently redistributing that pigment, moving that paint around my paper to create more organic looking gradients and soften edges. Before moving on with the rest of this watercolor painting process, I wanna take a quick moment to share about all of the amazing and super helpful content that I am constantly publishing over at my Patreon site on a regular basis that is available for you at a very, very low monthly cost. This is my membership site, which I created about a year ago in which I am constantly sharing new exclusive content in the form of real-time, step-by-step, fully narrated drawing and watercolor painting tutorials 
each complete with its own downloadable outline sketch, its supply list with specific colors and high resolution reference images. I also share a new weekly sketchbook prompt every single Monday that is specifically designed to keep you consistent and progressing your artistic skills and knowledge. There are monthly live classes on art fundamentals and Q and A's where we can interact directly and you can ask me all of the questions you'd like. You get access to a vault of reference photos taken by myself that gets updated every single month with five new images. Immediate access to my downloadable workbook called How to Find Your Own Artistic Style and Voice. Access to a community of growing artists where you can share your work and get feedback from me and much more. We already have a library of over 30 real-time drawing and watercolor painting tutorials that you can access immediately after joining the $6 tier and upwards. And there's also a library of 15 classes on art fundamentals in which I share everything that I learned in art school in a sequential order that you can access immediately after joining the $15 tier and upwards. So it's quite literally my little online art school and I would absolutely love for you to go and check it out. I'm constantly being asked for slower tutorials here on YouTube, but the fact of the matter is that this platform doesn't really play well with longer videos. And even if I do take a very long time creating these fully narrated videos for you guys, very few people are going to watch them due to the algorithm. And it's just not sustainable for me. And this is why I decided to create this Patreon membership site in order to make things more sustainable for myself, because I do need to continue buying art supplies and equipment and making sure that I have the time to film and edit these videos, which is very, very time consuming. I am very, very passionate about what I do and I love creating helpful content to share and I would really love to be able to do this long term. So I am so very thankful to everyone that has joined my community over on Patreon. It means the world to me that you are there and I am so excited to continue growing this innermost art community of mine and continue providing immense value for you. Thank you for listening and thank you to those of you who have taken a moment to check out my Patreon website and even those of you who have joined the $1 tier. You are also making a huge difference, so thank you, thank you, thank you. After having said all that, let's jump right back into the watercolor painting process. So right here, I have finished up with the second layer of paint throughout the glaze sections on the three donuts. So it is now time to jump back to the visible bread sections of the donuts, which at this point, they are completely 100% dry because we have allowed our painting to dry completely and we have been working on the glaze sections. So what I am working on right now is creating the illusion of that visible yet irregular and imperfect line that we often see around the middle section of donuts. So I have switched on over to my size 12 round brush. This isn't my smaller brush yet. And I'm using just the tip to very gently start creating the illusion of this very imperfect line. And notice how I am not creating one continuous line with one same weight from one end of my donut to the other end. I am actually creating this line in sections, making sure that I am creating variation in these line segments in terms of both thickness and value. So I am making certain sections of my lines very, very light and translucent and other sections of my lines I'm darkening by going over them with a darker, more saturated color to really create that natural looking variation. And I even like to stay away from using the term line when it comes to attempting to create a higher level of realism, because in realism, there are no lines. And how I like to think of this is that if I were to do a very, very intense zoom into the lines that I have just created right there in the middle sections of those donuts, we would actually see a little organic shape as opposed to one straight continuous line. I really want to stay away from any visible outline looking things or even stark looking lines or anything like that because I am trying to go for a higher level of realism. And as you can see, I switched on over to work on the other bread parts again throughout the three donuts. I am deepening and darkening some values here and there and really adding further dimension to these bread sections. 
I am constantly looking at my reference picture for clues as to what areas to darken and what areas to leave lighter. Okay, so at this point, the entire visible bread sections of the three donuts have to dry completely before going back in and further darkening certain sections. And we're also going to even be darkening some little tiny segments within that line around the donut, but we want to make sure that those areas are completely dry before we do that. So I am jumping back to the icing sections on the donuts and further developing darker values in there. At this point in the painting process, they are completely dry once again. So I am working wet on dry at this point. And the deeper and deeper I get with my values, the more important it is for me to keep that color um, in those areas of darker color that I'm able to perceive in my reference picture. So the further along I move along in my painting process, the more wet on dry I use or the less amount of water I use. As you can see, I am still using that same technique in which I lay down my deep and saturated color on my watercolor paper in my darkest area. And then I go back in with a clean and only slightly dampened paintbrush and kind of move that paint around a bit redistribute that pigment if necessary in order to create a more natural looking gradient and to soften any edges I feel need to be softened. I am, however, making sure to stay away from areas of highlight or very light values because I don't want to get any more pigment in these areas. If you feel you're at any point in time laying down way too much color or way too much water on your watercolor paper, make sure to go right in and absorb that excess water paint with your absorbent towel, which is super, super important to have on hand. I'm gonna be leaving you a link down below in the description box to the absorbent towels that I love using and I buy via Amazon, but even a kitchen paper towel will do. But having one of those on hand is incredibly important so that you can quickly absorb excess water paint from your watercolor paper. And you can also create some pretty cool effects with them. After having worked on developing some darker values throughout the icing sections of my three donuts, it was now time to switch back to working on the visible bread sections. And as you can see, I am really taking my time with this. I am constantly looking at my reference picture. I switched on over to my smallest brush that I am using for this painting, which is a size six round brush. And I am only laying down those darker yellows and almost browns in these bread areas where I'm actually able to see them in my reference picture where it makes sense. So usually the icing has a little bit of volume um, created above or around Around the bread which creates a little bit of shadow depending on the light situation but right there you can see me lay down those darker values right below the icing now as you can remember we started the bread sections with my cadmium yellow pail and then we moved on to using cadmium yellow pail plus yellow ochre and then as I continued darkening my values in these areas I started using only yellow ochre and at this point I am using yellow ochre plus burnt umber. I'm already starting to get into the browns. Notice, however, that we're still able to see that super light yellow shining from underneath all of these beautiful values that we have started to develop. And that is why I really like laying down an initial layer of very bright, vivid color whenever I am painting a subject where it fits, right? Because that bright color is going to shine from underneath all of the subsequent layers that you start creating. As you can see, I am even starting to use this light brown color to go over certain segments of the lines in the middle of the bread section that we had started developing already. But I am only keeping this darker value in certain tiny spaces here and there. I am staying patient and making sure that I am taking my time developing these values in layers if needed. I am not being too finicky, being careful not to overwork my paper. And later on, if we have to come back and dark in certain areas, we can take care of that then. Okay, you guys, so it's time to allow those bread sections to dry once again. And I switched on over to working on the icing on the top donut. And I'm going to be moving downwards as I have been doing. So 
As you can see right there on my paint mixing palette, I have added in another color to further darken this pink that I have created for the strawberry donut. And the color that I started adding into my alizarin crimson to darken those pinks is just a little bit of Payne's Gray. You can see it right there on the right section of this little well in my paint mixing palette, that is Payne's Gray, mixed together with Alizarin Crimson. And I am making sure that I am only adding in this very dark pink in the areas where I'm able to see them in the reference picture, nowhere else. Okay, allowing that to dry and we're jumping right onto the chocolate donut and guess what color I added into my burnt umber to further darken this chocolatey brown. You guessed it, I added Payne's Gray to this one too. As you guys know who already have seen many of my videos and know that I love using a limited color palette for my paintings, I really like keeping things limited and making sure that I am using um, the same colors in different color mixtures whenever I can so that my paintings really look unified and harmonious at the end. So at the end, the icings of all of my donuts are gonna have at least a little bit of Payne's Gray in them. So everything looks very cohesive. Of course, depending on the complexity of the subject that you're painting and the type of subject that you're painting, this principle can be a little bit more difficult to put to use. But whenever I'm able, I just really like giving some thought to how I can reuse the same color again and again, maybe in different ratios with other colors, etc. Okay, so I'm gonna go quiet as I continue deepening some values here and there, jumping from element to element, and you're gonna see how I go back into the bread sections once again. And something important to have in mind here is that because I am working wet on dry, my painting is drying quite quickly. So for the most part, the paint that I am laying down is staying constricted in one area, creating a sharp looking edge, unless I continue placing paint on an area of paper that I have already kind of worked on. In these cases, the paint gently dissipates into the dampness of the paper. However, when compared to the wet on wet technique that I was using in the beginning layers of paint for this piece, my painting is generally speaking drying a lot faster because I am using a less amount of water. So it's gonna depend on the amount of water that you are using as well as the temperature and the humidity of the room that you're in. But you do have to stay mindful if at any point in time you feel that it is time to allow that layer of paint to dry, leave it to dry and come back to it later. It's a lot better this way.
Okay, so it's time to allow everything to dry completely and I'm gonna be adding a little bit of cast shadow below and to the right of the stack of donuts. So the first thing that I did was, once again, I pre-wetted this area. I had a good look at my reference picture for clues as to the shape of the cast shadow and the different values that I'm gonna be developing within the cast shadow. And I am using my size 14 round brush to very gently start dropping in my Payne's Gray into this entire area. I created my initial layer of very light translucent gray. And as you can see right there, Taking advantage of the fact that my paper was already damp, I started dropping in an even more saturated version of this Payne's Gray mixture only in the darker areas of my cast shadow, which usually the darkest areas of your cast shadow are gonna be the areas of the shadow that are closest to the actual subject because they're being blocked by light completely. And the important thing here that I make sure to have in mind is that because I am going for a realistic look with this illustration, I am making sure to develop a wide range of values even within the cast shadow. Later on, I'm gonna go back into this area and further darken the values closest to my donut stack. So I am allowing that area to dry completely before going in in a bit. Okay, so we are in the home stretch of this painting process. We are almost done. And as my cast shadow continues to dry, I take this opportunity to further darken little darkest values here and there throughout my three donuts. Watercolor does tend to dry lighter than how it looks when it's wet. So I always like coming back and taking a moment to observe and have a good look at my reference picture alongside my painting and just kind of acknowledging whether certain spots need to be darkened. I'm gonna go quiet once again as I continue working on this. Okay, so it's time to finish my work on the cast shadow and as you can see right there, I go in with a very saturated Payne's Gray mixture and I am just adding it into the areas closest to my stack of donuts. So as you can see, I end up with a large variety of different values even within the cast shadow area. Okay, so the very last thing that I'm gonna do here that I often like doing in my watercolor paintings, at least when I'm painting this type of subject, is I like going in with a very light, translucent, yet bright color. And this is sort of a wash that is gonna bring everything together within the bread sections. And in this case, I am using a wash of yellow ochre plus cadmium yellow light. And I am covering up the bread sections very, very lightly in a very loose kind of way and making sure to stay away from the lightest areas of highlight. When I do these final washes, I like making sure that everything is completely dry so that the colors and the values that I've created don't move at all. And it's just a very light wash that helps bring all of the different values together. At the very end, if I wanna soften out any harsh edges or little lines here and there, I take a moment to do just that with a clean and only slightly dampened paintbrush. And we are done. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this longer and more full tutorial. If you did, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and share with anyone who you feel will enjoy or get something out of this video because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps other artists get to know about my channel. 
If you have any questions or comments, make sure to leave them down below in the comment section. I always love hearing from you guys and read every single comment that you leave me. I'm gonna leave a couple of other watercolor videos for you to check out next right here. Don't forget to subscribe so that I can see you very soon for another video and stay inspired. Bye guys.